Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland, and today I've got Drew Stoltz with me. Drew, what's up, man? How are you? Good to be with you, Brett. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. It was good to have you. You know, I listen to your podcast and I listen to your radio show when I can. Uh, and so you've got the podcast subpar. You've got the uh, the radio show on Sirius XM Radio uh, called uh, The Gravy and the Sleaze, right? And yes, sir. So you guys That's are it. doing some pretty awesome stuff, man. So I'm excited to be with you today. We'll talk a little golf. We'll talk a little business, talk a little life. Sound good? I love it. I'm in for anything and everything, dude. All right, Let's man. touch so, all the bases. You, you know, you've got the job where you're interviewing guys I like to watch every weekend. You just had Justin Thomas on your podcast, what, last week? I think week before you had Matthew Yeah, we had Wolf. a little run there yeah. with South Florida boys. We had Justin Thomas, Ricky Fowler, Matthew Wolf there for a three-week stretch. So that was a, that was a nice little run for us That's there. That's awesome. That's yeah. very cool. And isn't it, I mean, I would assume I'm never around those guys, but uh, I would assume it's pretty cool to hang out with guys that are at that level. I mean, in the sport, but yet they're still the same as you and I, they want to have a couple of drinks and have some fun with their friends and, uh, and then go play some golf. Yeah. It's an easy thing to forget when you see them on TV and they're in the, you know, they're coming down the stretch and they're kind of, you know, in the zone more or less, you forget, like, that's kind of the goal of this whole podcast, actually, that we started like Colt and I, my partner who I do it with, like we were lucky enough to, to grow up with a lot of these guys and know them before they became the Justin Thomases of today or Ricky right. Fowler or Tony Finau's and these guys. Right. And I'm like, man, there's so much there's so much personality that these guys have that really don't get featured in a typical golf broadcast. Right. They come right off the golf course and it's the quick two or three questions, you know, the cliche stuff. Like, how was your round? What'd you think right. about? What about the putter? What's your game plan for tomorrow? It's like, dude, that doesn't give these guys any room to run. Like nobody, like Kevin Hart's not going to look fun, you know, like look like he's right. got much spunk right. being asked these questions. So that was kind of the whole thought process behind the podcast was like, man, let's, let's go to these guys who we know like to cut up and have a good time. And let's dig into some stories that people haven't heard before. Let's show them that let's give them the opportunity to really showcase their personality because so many of these guys have it there's just not really a place for them to show it and so that was yeah. kind of the deal with the podcast like yeah we want to hit some serious golf stuff and get the information that the golf diehards are going to want to learn but more often than not the comments that i get from people after shows like man what a cool story that this guy told i had no idea or, wow this right. guy was way funnier i used to not like this guy for whatever now he's one of my favorite guys <laughs> that so that's cool, kind right? of the yeah that's kind of the goal of the entire show is just to let these guys open up and see them as people not just like the guy that's you know, hoisting a trophy at yeah. the end of the week. Yeah. And I think too, I mean, and, and I'm always fascinated with the history behind some of this stuff. So doing my research, I read that Colt, uh, he gave you a buzz and said, Hey, I got this chance with Sirius radio. I want you to be on the show with me. Right. You just said, yeah, cool. I'm a thousand percent in. I mean, so the, for the person listening, w when do you know you're ready and how prepared do you have to be to be ready to make it happen? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, that's how it shook out with this with gravy in the sleeves and with with Colt. That's how it got started. He was going through some injuries on the PGA Tour. I think he kind of saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this long term and things like that. So we started looking at what's the next thing. And that's when he started talking with Sirius XM and things like that. But rewind about three years prior to that, right when I had gotten out of the game of golf, I played for about seven years out of college from the, all the way from the lowest rent mini tours to the PGA tour. I played events on all those and everywhere in between. And when I got out at the very end of my career, if you want to call it a career, um, I'm a, one of my close friends is Gary McCord. So he's a guy mm -hmm. that lives in town here. We play a ton of golf together. He's, I, he's almost like a, a mentor, like as much as he likes to play the jester and the funny guy, he's a really, really smart, really thoughtful Dude, so he's the guy that I would go to all the time for advice, right. whatever. We just go grab drinks and just talk. And so I called him when I just had decided finally, like, I've had enough. I'm done. I called Gary and I, he's like, say no more. I could sense this was coming. Meet me tomorrow at the club. I want to sit down and have a couple of drinks. Done. So I went up there, sat with Gary. And at the time, Gary said, here's what I want to do. I've been thinking about this for a while because I've kind of known you were, you know, on your last legs out there. Uh, I want to do a radio show and I've talked to Sirius XM and it's all a go. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to air on this date. It's going to be called this and we're going to start doing it. It's like, let's get together, start brainstorming and start putting a show together. So I was like, oh my God, here I am one day out, you know, of uh, right. not playing golf anymore. And I got like a dream set up here with Gary McCord, one of my favorite people in the world. So he and I started brainstorming, coming up with shows, things like that. And we were all ramped up, ready to go at the 11th hour. Uh, Gary McCord was with CBS at the time and they kind of control the rights to what you can and can't do. So okay. the way I understand it is they kind of put the kibosh on this deal and said, Hey, CBS controls you. You know, if you're not, when you're no longer with us, like you can do whatever you want, but as long as you're with CBS, we, we got, you know, we got our, our got pick of what you can and can't do exactly. So 11th hour, the thing gets, he calls me. He's like, dude, I'm so sorry. Turns out this isn't going to work. 
but stay ready. There's going to come a time where we can do this. And so I'd already kind of, I don't say got my foot in the door. We literally never did a show, but I at least started thinking about it. And I was so excited to do it that when it didn't happen, I was pretty disappointed, but never, I, I went on to do other things in my, like, you know, during this stretch of time, but I always looked back at like, I want to find a way to make this happen. Cause I think this is something I'd really enjoy. And I think it's something that we could really, where I could really thrive. And so then when the opportunity came with Colt, I was like, Yes, absolutely. I'm on board. And then that started. We were one day a week, one hour show. I mean, it was a pretty much like a trial run. Let's see how this thing goes, right? With Sirius. And we had a pretty good run there the first year. We were able to get some guys on, do a little bit of the stuff I was talking about, like we do with the podcast, right? See, see a different side of these guys. And then, boom, next thing you know, the next year, you know, we're pretty much a daily show. We're on there two hours a day and we're rocking and rolling. So that's, that's how it came Incredible. to be. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I just think it's awesome too. And I think that, you know, you got to be willing to put in the work, right? Anybody can, no, I shouldn't say anybody. Let me back that up. People can get a show, but then it's actually doing something with it. But what I liked when I did my research and it's like that, whether you're doing what I did and, and when I was 23 years old and starting building a financial planning practice and doing that now for 20 years, or if it's, you know, running a podcast and now, you know, I gotta, I gotta send messages to guys like you and hope you respond. But it, it's that, <laughs> it's that same thing you're doing, right? Is the people that are listening, it's putting in that work and that effort behind the scenes that nobody even sees to make you be successful. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So when I first, when we first got our gig, you know, our, our opportunity, I was like, this is a chance, you know, this is an opportunity. We have to make the most of this. And I, like, I think you get a little bit, um, it can be confused. I don't want to say confusing, but it can be when you, when you listen to the really good radio hosts, in my opinions, right. The guys that are do really well, whoever it might be, Ryan Rosillo, Van Pelt, Howard Stern, whoever it is you like to listen to, it sounds like they just turn on the mics like, hey, guys, welcome back to the show. And it's like they're just going and they're just free will. And they just sat down on the chair two seconds ago. And like these are all, you know, ad lib, right. you know, train of thought type of deals. But if you look behind the scenes and peel that back and in talking with some of the guys that I have a lot of respect for, like, how do you prep for a show? How do you map it out? What do you do? There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and a lot of prep. And it's those guys that are so good that make it look like it's easy and it's just natural but it comes with a lot of preparation like a jim nance for instance on television yeah. right he looks like he could do anything you could give him sleep. 12 minutes of dead air and be like nance fill it and he'll be able to do it but there's yeah. so much that goes on behind the scenes to get ready for that that that's the way you want it to be portrayed it's like this looks effortless when in reality there is a lot of work and time behind the scenes to make sure like it's mapped out and then things go smoothly yeah yeah, you look at those guys, and I've seen some before, like a Joe Buck here locally in St. Louis, and you, you look at his notebooks, right? It's just note after note after note after note that takes a week per, to prepare for one game. And it's just oh, yeah. he knows more about that game than anybody. And, and that's, and that's why those guys do. are so good. It seems like it's just, oh, off the top of the head, this is something he knows everything about. Well, yeah, five days ago, he might not have known anything about right. some of these teams. Like, same with but the college analyst, like a Kirk Herbstreet, who's yep. a good buddy of mine. Like I've talked to him about how he preps. He's like, dude, we may do it. He's like, they're lucky because they get the big games, right? He's getting the marquee games every week. Right. But he's like, there's games when I was just starting this thing. I didn't know one player on either team. And I got to show up on Saturday and be like, here's the real coordinator. This is what they talked about this week. Oh, their seconds, their backup quarterback's going to be, the, you know, like there's so many things you just, if it, come, it, it comes off naturally, but there's a lot of prep behind it. Yep. So what are you learning? Um, from these guys like the Justin Thomases of the world. I mean, I'm assuming you can sit back and kind of watch a guy like that and say, okay, here I am hanging at his house. I'm interviewing him. Then I'm going to interview Ricky before or after whichever way it went. I can't remember, but, but then you, again, you see him on TV on a Sunday at the masters or the, or the PGA or whatever it be. What are you learning from those guys that you can share with our listeners that that extra gear they may have that helps, whether it's on the golf course or in the boardroom. Yeah. And talking with these guys and just being lucky enough to, to be around them, right? Like I'm lucky enough. I play at a golf club up here. There's there's 15 tour pros, and we, you know, from world number two, John Rom, down the list, guys that have won majors. Yeah. So I'm around those guys. I've gotten to play golf with them. The thing that I notice most in talking with them and just observing these guys, there's very little in in most regards in terms of talent differential. I would argue, right? I think you have your elite guys. You got your there's some certain some special guys out there, right? I, Rory McIlroy's got talent like you can't duplicate. Dustin Johnson, some of these guys are just, you're not going to get, you know, no matter how much you practice, they're going to have something that you don't have. Yep. But if you move past those top, call it 15, 20 guys in the world, from that point on, it's like, these guys are more, you watch them on the driving range, you go play a few rounds of golf with them. There's not much that separates these guys, right? I mean, they can all hit it. They can all put it. They can all chip it. Very little separates these guys in terms of like talent or skill set. I think the guys that you see that we're, you know, that we're talking to and the guys that find their way to the top of the world golf rankings and 
winning major championships and playing Ryder Cups and President's Cups, there's something inside their brain that like they they have a different gear in terms of like their mental, like their, their mindset, right? I'll take one guy, for instance, who I play a lot of golf with out here, and that's John Rahm. He's a guy, he was number, world number one earlier in the year. He sits at world number two right now. But like, I don't care if you're playing John Rahm for $5 or if it's the, if it's the Sunday of Augusta National, like right. he wants to rip your face off and stomp on it. And if he loses, <laughs> it hurts him. You know what I mean? Right. And like, that's, and you just don't see that with, with that many guys. There's just a certain, I guess it's like a winner's mindset. You could call it that like, these guys are so driven that I think losing, uh, pushes them to become as good as they or failure i should say pushes them to become as good as they are because golf is a game that can beat you up man no matter how good you are you're gonna have failure you're gonna have times where you're not playing well but these guys that find their way to the top it's more of a mindset than it is a physical thing because so many of these guys are really good and i've seen guys that never got a pga tour card never earned a tour card that i would stack up and say from a talent perspective that guy is a top 50 player in the world yeah but yet he never got there so right. why is that right there's just something different like like you look at a Kobe or a Jordan, right? Those are two guys in the NBA that yeah. would stand out. Like they just had something in the fourth quarter. Like I ain't losing. They got and there's gear. that in the golf world. Exactly. Yeah. Just like a, a killer mentality or Mamba mentality, whatever you want to call it. I think that translates to the golf course as well. Some guys desire to be the best just drives them no matter what. And some guys I think are totally content just to be like, I'm on the PJ tour. I make right. a nice living. Uh, th- I'm doing what I love, but I'm not trying to be world number one and win. You know what I mean? They're just happy to be with there. And that's fine yeah. too. But that's what separates the, the top guys from the, you know, 89th well, on yeah. the FedEx cup guys. When you look at the scoring at right in the boardroom, we don't get to keep score like that. I don't know if I got a par birdie or a triple bogey. Right. But, but in the golf world you do. And if you look at whether you're number one or the 150th best person on tour, I haven't looked at this in the, in a few years now, but I think at one point it was like one and a half or call it two strokes difference over the whole season, right? Their average score was literally one and a half strokes difference. That's, that's, that's two little four foot putts oh, yeah. per round. And yet it's millions and millions and millions of dollars. I, I would argue that professional golf is the, is the finest line between top guys in the world and guys you've never heard of in your life. And you could go yeah. out there and play, put them both out there on a Tuesday at your home club. Yeah. And the, the 150th guy might wear out the dude that's number 18 in the right. world. Just smoke. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's no other sport. I, you can't take a guy from the Canadian football league and throw him in at this, as the starter for the Kansas city chiefs. And he's going to look like Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, you know what I mean? There's, that doesn't exist. If it was that guy, he'd be in the league and he'd be starting. Right. right. And golf, it is so different. And it's such a fine line that it's just like, any given day, anything can happen. And the yeah. best can lose the guys that are middle of the road. And that's what makes it so tough is that there's just a bottleneck to get in there. There's, there's a lot of guys that are good enough to play on the PGA tour, but there's very few spots opening up every year. And that's why it is a, it's a tough place. It's, it's really tough to get there. And once you get there, you don't want to leave because there's a million guys standing right there at the door waiting, waiting for you to fall yeah. off to get your spot. Well, I always say too, and I'm obviously I'm biased. Me and my buddies will, will talk about this, but golf's the only sport where you got to earn your check every week. You know, you could be at the St. Louis Cardinals and I won't name a name, but you could be a starting X position and you could get paid $19 million a year and you bat 190, right? And you still get your $19 million a year. Well, if you're going to bat 190 and on the PGA Tour, you're not making squat. Now you hopefully make your bag deal, your club deal, your clothes, all that stuff. But that's different, right? Because you got to go out and earn that check every single week. So I'm not trying to convert people to believe my beliefs here, but that's, that's what I think, Drew. You, you okay with that? I'm absolutely, you're exactly right. I mean, that's the only sport where you get paid directly, I guess maybe tennis too, but yeah. where it directly correlates to how well you do. There's no right. oh, mega deal. I can take a few years off and I'll play, I'll try hard again once it's my contract year. I mean, yeah. how often do you see that, right? Oh, oh he's right. having a huge year finally. Oh yeah, it's his contract year. Maybe that's right. there's something to that. That's right. So you uh, you said you played on the tour a little bit. You, you, you kind of did that grind for a while. How hard was that for you when you knew you were going down a path and where I'm going with this is when that person's going down a path where they have to tell themselves, it's not the path they need to go down. They need to look for something else. How was that for you? Was that difficult? How emotional was it? And how did you make that decision? Yeah, it's a good question. It, it, it absolutely is difficult. And I think there's very few people out there. So I was 30 years old when I, when I stopped playing and I, for me, I put a hard stop on myself. I said, I'm, when I'm 30, if I haven't got, if, I, if I'm not holding a PGA tour card or at least a full corn Ferry card, at the time, like I'm done because there are young guys coming up. The, the year that I quit was the year that Jordan Spieth was trying to win the, the grand slam <laughs> as a 21 <laughs> year old. You know what I mean? I'm like, who am I kidding, dude? I'm 30. I'm about to turn 30 
here's a 21 year old kid doing things I never even thought about doing. Like I yeah. never wanted to be the guy. And I was, I've seen him throughout the entire time I was playing. I don't want to be the 39 year old guy at the web.com event who Monday qualified and doesn't have a card and doesn't have a career. is never going to make it still kidding myself because he's too scared to go out in the real world and do something else. Yeah. Cause golf is all he knows. It's the only thing he's ever done. But when you commit yourself and really, I mean, my entire life from the time I was, 12 is when I really started to be like, this is what I want to do. And I want to do this to the fullest extent. Every day, my life revolved around golf. And how do I get better at golf? When am I going to practice? What tournament? How am I doing, you know, going to see a coach, whatever it was. So all of a sudden to just flip a switch and say that no longer matters. That's a really hard thing because all right, what I, I would wake up the next day after I quit. I'm like, I feel guilty. Almost like I should be out practicing. You know, that's right. my mindset. That's what I've been my whole life. And I'm like, no, you shouldn't, dude. You should be trying to find out what's the next thing because that no longer, and just putting that aside, it's a really hard thing. And you see it, and I didn't even have a big career. I wasn't like stepping off the PJ tour or anything. It was just, yeah. I no longer am, am pursuing this as a profession, yeah. but it's still a hard thing to step away from when your whole life's been devoted to one thing to just say, flip a switch one day, boom, that doesn't matter anymore. Well, now you're like the rest of us, man. You got an 18 month old and you can't say, <laughs> honey, golf is for work, right? I'm going to be gone for the next six hours, you know? And go golf every day of your life. So are you, are you getting exactly. out there much and enjoying it like the rest of us? Yeah, I get out there. I get out there as much as I can. It's a little tougher with work and with an 18 yeah. month old, because you know, you got any, that's 24 seven with the baby. So if I'm not there, somebody has got to be there and the stars kind of have to align for me to get out there. But when I do, man, it's, it's, it's so much more enjoyable just because I'm the guy that like, I don't take it too seriously, but I'm out there having cocktails. I like the music playing. I like to have a good right. time. And still, I want to compete. I want to gamble. I still get my fix, you know, from that. Like I want to, I have a heart. I don't think I can play golf. I show up to the golf course and just like, all right, let's, let's play for some pride today. I like to have something on the yeah. line. Cause that's where I get my competitive, my competitive fix from. That's right. that's um, right. But shockingly, I I'm playing some really good golf when I do get out there. And I think a lot has to do with the fact that like, I don't care anymore. If I hit a bad shot, I'm like, yeah, well, I'm supposed to, I'm right. supposed to suck. I, I don't, don't play, play anymore. I Whereas suck. before I was like, Oh my God, dude, I'm doing the wrong things. I got to go to the range. I need to get my coach, yeah. whatever. It's just, it's like a weight off your shoulder. Yeah. Now you show up and hit a couple range balls, maybe, and go out to maybe. the first tee versus before yeah. you had all your alignment tools out and you got to do this and do that. And I need my hour. got a chip, got a putt, got to go yeah. over here. None of I'll, now I'm like, yeah. if I can get out there and get, four eight irons in before i walk to the first tee that's a win right, you're lucky you're lucky yeah what do you think about betting on golf now man and that stuff going live to where you start to see it on tv and stuff dude it's coming and it's coming in a major way and i think golf is unique in the sense that once they get all this stuff figured out i think you'll be able to see golf be the one sport where you can bet live shot by shot so like fast forward i don't know if it's a year two years five years whatever it is but final round of the masters all right rory and dj you know our first hole bet does rory hit the fairway you know whatever right. yes to minus pin, 200 man. no even money whatever and you can bet that bam all right next shot who's closer in proximity to the green or to the hole right uh rory dj bam and you'll be able to fire shot by shot which is like as a guy who loves to gamble that's fun <laughs> you know what i mean i, I don't want to make a bet like at the beginning on thursday be like will rory beat dj and then have to wait all the way till sunday to see if that plays out now you i think you're going to start seeing yeah. People have the opportunity to bet live shot by shot, which is exciting. PJ Tour is going to make a bunch of money. Whoever they align with is going to make a bunch of money. It also opens up a little a little uh, stickiness there with, all right, if dudes are out there betting big money on golf and you can get on the uh, somebody on site and potentially skew things your way, does somebody yell at the top of a backswing? Do they do something? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like there, there's, there's room for that to happen too, which I know the PJ Tour is exploring. But yeah, it's coming in a major way. That's a very good point. Yeah. You can't do that in football or basketball. Like, hey, go yell at LeBron during the free throw. All right, right. well, there's 70,000 people doing it, but it ain't yeah, getting you know I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. I never thought of that. Um, so so talk to us about now when you look at your future and, and golf is is over from a standpoint of getting to play it professionally, but now what's the future look like? What What is Drew looking forward to? What are you and Colt looking forward to with your shows? What, what's What's out there? Yeah, I'm looking forward to just seeing where we can go with this podcast and this radio show, like most right now, right? Just re-upped on both of those deals through next year. So we're excited. This podcast that we launched, uh, we started last year in February. So it's only been 10 months, but we've had some really big success with that, man. Almost like to the point where it's surprising. We just, we were in the top, we've been in the top 20 in all of sports here the last few weeks. And it's starting to grow week by week. We see our audience getting bigger and bigger. We're getting bigger names. Cool thing is now we got some tour pros and some non golfers even reaching right. out about coming on the show. I mean, that's the dream, right? When guys are asking to yeah. come on 
And I really want to push that not only with golfers, but you'll see us branch out and do non-golfers, right? Even if it just touches golf a little bit. So we have some pretty big name entertainers and athletes who maybe, you know, not golf centric that we're going to get into, but I really want to do that. And I just want to push it. I just want to have interesting conversations with people that, um, you know, that the audience wants to listen to. And that's kind of one of my favorite things yeah. is just, let's see a different side of these guys. Let's open them up. And if we can laugh or you can learn something new, those are, that's kind of my two criteria, how I judge our, our shows. Like, all right, if we didn't learn anything new, but we laughed a whole lot the whole time, that's a great show. Right. And if right. we learned a bunch of stuff we hadn't learned before, but maybe didn't laugh, that's a good show. And if we can do both, then that's the, that's the ideal world. That's so just trying to push those things as much as we can. And then we'll, we'll see who knows what happens after that, man. We'll see what kind of opportunities go up. So what's one of the stories you can tell us on the golf course with one of these guys, you know, the, the, the Justins, the Rory's, the Roms, any of these types of guys that you can share that you're not worried about them hearing about it and being pissed off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, let me, let me rack my brain real yeah. quick. All right. I'll tell, I'll tell, I got, I got a few, but I'll go with the guy that we got, uh, that we've had on the show, John Rahman, who will have again. And I tell this story if he was sitting right here, right? I have no issue telling this because it's, it's pretty harmless, but it's funny. So like I said, we play a lot with John Rahm. I'm out there. We're having a good time. And like I said, he wants to kill you no matter what, right? He's always wanting to win five bucks, eight, five million bucks. He wants right. to win. We're out there one day and uh, Rahm's not having his best day. And we're playing a little team game and, and, and he's losing and and uh, we're getting up there to 17. I think Ron's Are these down. guys giving you guys strokes? So I don't take strokes against the pros typically. Like sometimes if there's a team game and I need to make the team game fair, I'll take strokes to do it that way. But if I'm playing straight up against somebody, what I ask for now is no strokes. I don't want to go back and say, hey, I beat you, I beat but him. I got right. two shots, right? That doesn't, I don't get any pride out of that. If any of my buddies are listening right now, please take note of this right here because I always <laughs> complain about this. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Okay, great. You beat me, but I have to give you five shots aside or something. Yeah, I mean, like my terrible. dad can go out and beat me with the right amount of shot. You know what I mean? But yeah. it's like, I want to beat you, beat you. So that's my whole thing. So my deal now is typically I play, I play all the guys straight up, but I want odds based on who you are. So Rom, all right, dude, I'm three to one against you, bud. So it's my hundred versus your three or <laughs> all right, you over here, you're two to one. You know, I like, yeah. and I like to do it on the T too, to kind of make fun of guys. Like, oh, well, yeah. you're worse than Rom. So, you know, you'll never be as good as <laughs> so I'm only two to one against you. Like your that kind of no deal. Game, right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But this day that we were playing with John, it was all pros, right. Or all former pros. So there was no, we we're just like straight up game, no strokes. Let's just go get it. And, uh, Rom was not playing his best. And he's like, you know, he's, we step up on the 17th tee, which is a par three. And he's down, like, I mean, He's down 300 bucks, right? Let's call it that. And um, he hits the shot. It's a little short par three, back right pin. And it's a nine iron or something for John. And he kind of flares it a little bit to the right. And it lands in the top lip of the bunker and plugs. And John just uh -huh. loses his mind. And he's freaking out and throwing club. And, you know, just going through all right. this stuff, which is what he does, man. That's why he's so good. You see it on the PJ Tour all the time. He, yep. He's a guy that's fiery, right? He'll get out there and he'll show you how he's feeling. And uh, he plugs it and he's... And we're laughing. We're giving him a hard time, just kind of egging him on. I'm like, yes, lose it. Freak it, you know, break something, all this type of stuff. <laughs> and uh, so he kind of gets over. I was like, I was like, damn, dude, you're down 300 bucks. I was like, you, you make, you're going to make 200. Yeah, I was like, you make 200 grand a week. Like who gives right. a shit? You know right, what I mean? Right. Basically more or less. And this is a great line. I don't even know if it was intentional or not, but he's like 200 grand a week. He's like, I make way more than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we all just started yeah. dying laughing. We're like, Exa exactly, bro. Like, you know what I mean? But it's just one of those lines. Like, I don't even know if you, like, it was totally yeah, harmless. He wasn't trying to be a prick about it. No, he wasn't like, trying to be an asshole or anything. He's like 200, 200 grand a week. He's like, I make way more than that. I was like, there you go, bud. Yeah. You can afford the 300. Yeah. You're going to be, right. you're going to be just fine. But that's one that kind of sticks out to me. Like that just shows you John, like it's the type of dude he is, you know? Right. Yeah, it's yeah. not about the money at that point, right? I mean, it's about yeah. I don't I don't want to get beat by this guy because now he I just wants to win the rest of my life. And well, I'll see every time I see him now, I'll be like, "You still making more than two hundred a week or something?" You know, it's like just a joke yeah. or whatever. Right. He's like, "Oh yeah, of course, dude." Like, yeah. It's just kind of funny, like and probably will uh, be for quite a while for yeah long for perpetuity. I think yeah yeah, yeah. good for yeah. him, man. So um, when you when you look back on your career and, and the things you've done and, and the things maybe you wish you did and the things you wish you do going forward, what's what's some advice you would give yourself? If I could look back and, and talk to myself when I got out of college, I think the thing that I struggled with most that other guys were a lot. And this has been my, this way. I've been this way my whole life is structure. Um, I needed to manage my time better. I think I could have been way more efficient 
with my practice and not, not with the amount of time that I spent. Cause I was out there playing. I, I was a guy that always liked to play more than I liked to practice. I, yep. I feel like that was the, the ultimate thing you're trying to do is play good golf. So sitting there and hitting balls for five hours, like that didn't do it for me, but I, I practiced a ton, but it was the way that I practiced and hearing some of these guys, as I got later into, you know, my playing days and, and how they start, they're like, Oh yeah. From nine to 10, that's a uh, hundred yards and in. And then from, uh, 10 to 11, I moved from 100 to 125. And I play this type of game. And I, I, hit, I, I can't quit until I hit this many within 10 feet. And then the next hour, I take a 30-minute break. And then I come back, and it's you know 130 to 160 shots. And I have to do this before I can leave. Then I go to putting, and I got to do – like, I didn't have – you know what I mean? Like, it's so structured in how they did things. It was way more, way more precise than what I did. It was like, oh, I'm going to go out and hit some. And then I'm going to go chip. And then I'm going to go play with my buddies. And then I might come back and – hit some more chips or putts and then I'll go home. But it was never like, it wasn't like a job. Like if you have a job, you come in like, all right, I show up at nine and this is what I have to do for the day. And then when I'm done with that, like I leave, I didn't have that for golf. It was more like, let's show up, see what's, see how I'm feeling. And hopefully we'll grab a game with some of, you know, some of the fellas later on gamble a bit. And then, and that's, I think you need some of that too. I don't think it can be all practice all the time. You need that happy medium, but I would have been way more structured with the way I spent my time on off weeks and even at tournaments too. I just, these guys that I saw out there, I was like, man, like that's a pretty regimented practice routine. You know, I didn't, I didn't have that. That would be the advice I would give myself. Yeah. It's good advice. I mean, I talked to with our clients and advisors or whoever else, you know, just anybody really that will listen um, is a 90 minute focus. So take that for a whole day, but take your 90 minutes and how do you start the first 90 minutes of each day? And if you can control that 90 minutes and get, you know, these three or four or five things done, there's a much greater likelihood for success long-term than versus just letting the day happen and wherever your email takes you or the phone call takes you, you got to have that structure. And so I think I heard one time, and I may be off of my math, but I think they said Tiger Woods said, what, 80% practice, 20% play or something like that is what he did. Yeah, there's different ratios for different yeah. guys, you know, and I've seen guys be successful both ways. There's guys at Whisper Rock that are, always practice. Martin Keimer is a guy that is when he's out there, like you don't see him on the golf course. He's on the back of the range and he's doing all kinds of stuff. And he'll be back on the putting green and you'll go off to tee off on number one. And when you make the turn, he's still on the putting green. And then you'll go play the back nine. When you come back, he's on the chipping green. Like he never plays. So he's a non-player. And then on the, on the other side of that would be a Jeff Ogilvy, who's the guy who doesn't live here anymore. But when he did, I played tons of golf with Jeff. He was my favorite guy to play with on property because he was more like I was. He's like, I hate practice. As soon as I start practicing, I start tinkering. I yep. start thinking about things I never, and before I know it, I can be hitting it good. And then by the end of the day, I'm hitting it like shit. Right. And I'm like, what did I just accomplish? You know what I mean? So he was always the guy that liked the, and he was had a hell of a career. Yeah. Right. So it's hard to say which is right. I think it totally depends on the, the personality and the mindset of the yeah. guy. But I do, for me, I did better when people were like, I'm just not good with free time. I'm an ADD guy. Right. I'm all over the place. I get distracted super easy. I need somebody to be like, yo, for this next hour, and I would even take it a step further and be like that practice from eight to nine, if it's a hundred yards and in, there needs to be results oriented. It's like, all right, it's not just hit wedges for an hour. It's like, all right, dude, you have to do this. You know, like when you're putting, like, all right, I got to make 25 in a row from four feet. And if I miss, I start at zero, something like that to where you're locked in on every shot and you're not just mindlessly flicking wedges yeah. out there. Cause what does that really do for you? Right. So what advice would you have for the 10 or 15, maybe even the 20 handicapper guy, maybe 15, let's go 15. We'll go in the middle. I think the majority of your time, the two things, one, you need a go-to shot. It's so corny to say, but like, you got to find a shot off the tee that you can hit over and over. I don't care if it's a 30 yard banana slice, or if you're a guy that draws it and you aim right and you sling that thing back there, you need a shot that you can repeat. And I don't care if it's perfect or I'd, you're a slicer and you want to draw it, forget it. Just go out there and, and put it. the ball in play. And then from there, I would say, focus all of your attention on chipping and putting, because when you're a 15 to 20 handicap guy, it's going to yeah. take a lot of work for you to be a guy that hits a lot of greens. You're just not going to do it. So knowing that you're going to miss a lot of greens, the easiest way to tighten that score up from call it 90 to an 85 is around the greens. You can practice your driver all day long. You're not going to gain five yeah, shots, you know, unless you're blowing it out of bounds, you know, multiple times, but find a shot you can hit over and over and the rest, you need to be able to get the ball on the green when you're chipping it and give yourself a look at getting up and down. You're not going to make them all, but like, all, spend all your time around the greens and you're, that's the quickest way to shrink that handicap. Yeah. That's great advice. You know what I was, I was actually Florida and I've played golf my whole life, basically since I was six on that. I saw, I think it was the U S open and then the masters, they were talking about the leaders and like, I think it was Dustin Johnson and, and you probably know these stats, but they said throughout the week, 
his average distance to the flag on his, you know, his approach shot was 29 feet. You know, I'm thinking in my mind, right. As the average golfer, I'm thinking these guys are going eight feet, 12 feet, 15 feet, six feet, two feet. But in reality is the average shot was 29 feet. And I think most of us amateurs don't think of that. Oh, you, 30 no. feet away. You think they're stuffing it on every hole because you're watching the coverage and they, they, they'll go from lot, you know, they'll, they'll go back to it. Like, let's check in with Bill Hawes on 12 and right. bam, it's a laser wedge to, you know, a foot. I think like right. they're going to show you all the good shots. They're not showing you the guy out there at plus four is missing the right. cut. You know what I mean? There's some stuff going on. Like it's not as good. And even to elaborate on what you said, if you looked at even like their wedge stats, you'd think like, Oh, 125 and in these guys are hitting it within <coughs> eight, 10 feet every time. Right. It's just not the case. So as an average golfer, knowing that the best in the world who devote all day, every day to yeah. practicing that stuff are only hitting it that close. Like, unless you have all that time on your hands and you're a big talent, you're not going to do that. So yeah. tighten up the stuff that you're going to have to do all the time, which is chip and putt. Well, and that helped me actually a lot emotionally because I was like, you know, I'm the guy that if you hit one, you know, if you're a decent golfer, you can push one a little bit and you know that and you're 15, 20 feet right of the pin, but you know, you should be left. Well, then you're pissed off. Well, that affects the putt or it affects the chip shot or whatever versus just now saying, look, Dustin Johnson's winning the masters and he's averaging being around almost 30 feet to the cup on his approach shots. I think I can be okay. Yeah. Lowering that bar a little bit and being okay with, you know, putting for birdie. Yeah. Um, anything we need to do to stay active from an exercise standpoint, again, as average golfers and people that are in average shape, uh, what are we, what are we doing? I think the main, the, the number one thing, and I tell this to my dad or all my friends who are getting a little bit older, like, Oh, I'm just not as long as I was and things like that. I say, and it's an easy thing to do. It's flexibility. You do yeah. like, it's all flex. Like, you don't have to, like we've seen Bryson bulk up and become this animal, right. And yeah. he's hitting bombs and that's cool. You can also look at Justin Thomas. So you can almost put in your back pocket, you know, he weighs 140 <laughs> And he's hitting bombs too. You right. don't need to be big. It's not like lifting and working out. You need to, your hips need to stay loose. Your shoulders need to stay loose. Your back. I think flexibility gives you the range of motion because really speed comes from your big muscles, you know, your hips, your, your legs, your, you know, things like that. You don't need the weights. You just need to be able to turn a big turn. You can't, you can't, there's no substitute for that. And as you get older and as you work and you, you sit down for eight hours a day, everything gets jammed up. You just take time at night, 10 minutes, whatever it is, man, and just stretch, loosen everything up. That is the number, number one thing. That's why you see some of these older guys that being able to play so long into their careers now because they understand that. But it's all, I would say, number one, one A through one C as you get older, stretch your body, man. I like it. Just like Bernard Longer, right? Who, uh, oh. he, he beat Bryson in, in the Masters, the round they played together. I'm like, how about that? Little David getting, versus Goliath. 60 yards past him or whatever. Oh, it was beat. a joke. Yeah, it was an absolute joke. Bernard yeah. versus Goliath. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, where do our listeners find more? Drew Stoltz. Yeah, I appreciate it. You can check us out on Golf Subpar. That's our podcast. It releases every Tuesday on iTunes or anywhere, Spotify. We, we release them on YouTube every Tuesday as well. If you want to watch it live, we're in person with almost every guest we have. And then Gravy in the Sleaze on PJ Tour Radio, Sirius XM, Monday through Wednesday, 1 to 3 Eastern time right now. We have tons of guys on. I mean, we have all the golfers you can think of every every single you know every single week and then we go off of golf too like tomorrow for instance we got kirk curb street coming on talk college football playoffs so oh, cool. um you know we kind of we, we dabble in a little bit of everything but those are those are the two spots where i'm i'm most active right now and actually he i have a, a show coming golf. out yeah he plays a very little golf which is surprising um he should play more given his job and the places he goes and things yeah. like that he should play more and then um starting in january i actually have a new show coming out on pga tour radio with gary mccord so oh, full circle cool. like we we're talking about uh, we're going to have one day a week at, at nighttime. It's going to be nighttime. It'll be a little different vibe, right? When you got yeah. the, you know, the nighttime audience. So we'll, <laughs> we'll be cutting loose, telling a lot of stories, but Gary McCord, he's a, he's, he's a, awesome. he's a treasure in the golf world, man. So anytime you can get a mic in front of him, that's something to listen to. That's awesome. Last question for you. Who's the dream interview, man? Who, who you want to get on? Well, I'll tell you that I would give you two answers on that. In the golf world, mm -hmm. there's no question unequivocally. Anthony Jack. Kim. Anthony who? Kim. Anthony, Anthony Kim. Kim. Wow. We want AK. We want him bad. I actually played college golf with Anthony. My partner Colt knows him well. So we have communicated with Anthony. He ain't ready right now to come out. He's kind of in hiding. He's like a myth now. You know, he's, he's, a, he's right. like Sasquatch. There's sightings every now and then. You don't know whether they're real or not. But uh, I'm hopeful that when he is ready to talk and kind of come back out, that we're going to get first. What's crack his at him. message? Why, why him? Like, what's his? And I guess I don't I know think, the story. His story is so unique, man. He came out as a young stud out of college and kind of lit the, you know, 
very pretty quickly lit the PGA Tour on fire, yeah. but he did it in a way that was so different. He's he's not your typical country club kid. He's not the you know grew up <laughs> like um, he's he's a, got a little more street in him. He's got a little more hip hop R and B in him, right? And there's the stories going around. That's one of the reasons we want to talk to him. You know, he went out to the President's Cup in in San Francisco and put a beat down on uh, I believe it was uh, Allenby or Appleby, sort of Appleby, I believe. It's either Appleby or Allenby, one of the two. Anyways, yeah. and you know there was a comment like I saw Anthony Kim coming in at three o'clock last night. You know, twisted from the night before, and like there's stories about him partying, and and then all of a sudden, as quickly as he rose, he had the big deal at the Ryder Cup where he beat yeah. Sergio so bad in the singles. He was, bam, he was gone, and uh, nobody's heard from him. Kind of hard to, you know, it was a it was a quick of a fall from the top. As, yeah, as he you signed can a pretty big contract with Nike, I think early on. He had a big deal with Nike, and there's just some injuries and an insurance policy, and there's just a lot of questions that really haven't ever been answered with Anthony. I just think he's really unique and he's a guy that was so different in the world of golf from what we've yeah. seen before and all the cookie cutters. So he would be my golf guy. And if you're just talking entertainment world, uh, Jamie Foxx is my number one all time wow. entertainer. I uh, dude, I love and where I love the comedy scene. I'm big in it, but I think Jamie Foxx is the most talented entertainer. I would say in the world, comedy, acting, singing, all of it. He's a stud and he'd be my dream guy to sit down with. That's yeah. awesome. Have you, I don't know if you, uh, you got an 18 month old, so maybe you get Disney plus, but uh, Jamie Foxx's <laughs> daughter was just on a new movie called safety on Disney plus. We watched it as a family this weekend. It was phenomenal. A uh, real life story out of Clemson football where the guy oh, uh, yeah. all away, but phenomenal story. But his daughter was the lead, uh, was the lead actress in it. Well, she comes from good DNA. So she's probably going to be super talented too. That's right. That's right. Well, Drew, man, it's been awesome having you. We'll shoot people your way. Uh, you on Instagram and all that stuff too. Where are you at there? I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Both are at the sleazy man, T H E S L E E Z Y M A N. The sleazy man. All right, man. We will send people your way. And uh, thanks for being on the circuit of success. I appreciate you, Brett. Thanks for the time, man.